Good morning, good morning, everybody. How are you? Is everything okay? Nice. So, welcome to my talk about Secure Boot. Um, I will go with a round of interactions, but before that, can I ask you to raise your hand if you know what Secure Boot is? Nice. And can you raise your hand if you are using Secure Boot in production on your devices? Ah, interesting. What a difference. Okay, <laughs> we'll see why. Uh, let me do this this way. So first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Fabio Tranchitella. I'm a software engineer. Uh, I'm Italian, studied at the Polytechnic of Torino. Uh, I worked as a consultant for almost all my career, uh, working in different projects all around the world. Uh, today I'm head of product manager at Northern Tech, uh, though I'm a software engineer, so I understand the technicalities, and uh, I'm leading the Mender project. Uh, for Northern Tech. I'm a Debian developer. I joined the Debian project in 2004 and uh, I have a lot of history as an open source contributor. Uh, Northern Tech uh, is a company based in uh, Oslo, Norway. We implement products for connected devices and uh, Mender is our flagship product. It's an OTA solution. We update devices, update firmware, and of course this has a strict connection with the uh, uh, with secure boot and securing uh, the devices. Uh, but we also have an holistic overview of um, device lifecycle management and how to secure uh, your connected devices. So in this presentation, we will talk about secure boot, uh, but from a high level perspective uh, in terms of how it involves uh, securing the boot in a wider understanding of how securing your devices. So uh, this is more or less uh, the topic for today. Uh, we want to understand how Secure Boot works uh, with embedded devices and IoT. Uh, as you know, Secure Boot is not only used in embedded world, it's also basically on every computer, desktop, laptop you have. Uh, but edge devices are peculiar uh, because of their constraints, the physical location, their use cases. So we will try to look at Secure Boot from the embedded uh, perspective. The key takeaways for today are understanding uh, Secure Boot, so decomposing it into different use cases and technologies, the key components uh, that are part of Secure Boot, uh, the security implications, what you can achieve, what you can't achieve, because Secure Boot is not a one a stop for all the security aspects of your device, and uh, the limitations uh, that you have to take into account implementing Secure Boot. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Uh, so if you have questions, just keep them at the end and we will try to answer them. This is the agenda. Um, four main areas during the talk. Uh, we will discuss about security in general for edge devices, um, then how to secure the boot process. There are different ways to implement it. Secure boot is one of the options, but it's not the only one. Different use cases, and as I mentioned before, limitations and gaps, so things you cannot do with Secure Boot and how you can solve them using other tools. At the end, we will wrap up everything with the uh, conclusions and the uh, Q&As. So let's start with uh, a general understanding of uh, securing uh, connected devices and uh, what it means. Uh, at Northern Tech, we uh, tend to talk about device lifecycle management, and that's one of the key concepts. When we talk about devices, it's not only about provisioning them, uh, it's not only about commissioning them, uh, maintaining them, uh, but it's a whole journey from the design of your hardware device, uh, the building of, of the distribution you will run on it, designing how this device will communicate with the cloud services, how you will keep it up to date, in case of Mender for uh, OTA purposes, and how you will decommission it. So in this context, security means securing every step of the device lifecycle management, starting from the design till the decommissioning or eventually recommissioning. Secure boot is uh, strictly connected to several of these steps. Because as we will see later, securing the boot process requires the injection of keys into the device. If it's an embedded device, this means uh, injecting the keys in the hardware. So it involves changes in the manufacturing process, but of course also in the design part, because you have to ensure that the board you are selecting and the operating system you are selecting are compatible uh, with the technology that you want to use to secure the, uh, the boot process. But not only that, uh, also maintaining the device is extremely important because secure boot uh, will secure your boot process but you want to uh, be able to update the boot components in your device and you have to 
uh, take it into consideration. Not to mention decommissioning. The device have a limited life. Sooner or later you will have to decommission it and you have to do it in a secure way. So from a holistic point of view, uh, we talk about a triangle of trust. So every project which involves embedded devices is composed of three main actors. The people, persons, that will use the device either directly or indirectly. This is both, means both users of the device, but also uh, maintainers, so uh, the, um, the colleagues that will manage the device in the field, uh, troubleshooting it, for instance. The device itself, which involves its identity and how this device communicates with, with a backend, because a device, isolated device is not uh, probably what you are planning for. It's a device that will communicate with the cloud services. So there are uh, credentials, uh, there is a way to communicate with the cloud. Uh, you have um, uh, software that is running on it. And then, of course, the software itself, uh, which you deliver, install to the device, and then update. These three components, people, software, and device, uh, must be taking into account uh, when you plan the security of your device. And uh, as we used to, to say, authentication, authorization, and integrity are the key concepts for securing the device. Now we can go to, uh, to Secret Boot. And as I mentioned before, Secret Boot is a specific application. But we, let's keep in mind that it's a part of a bigger picture. So we want to ensure that the software which is running on the device is the software that we trust. Uh, because of the integrity, because of the authentication, because it's signed and we don't want uh, that external uh, actors can tamper the, um, the device. So let's go into the boot process and how we can uh, uh, secure it. So this is a high level um, overview of a boot process of a Linux device. So generally speaking, we can split the, um, the boot components into these categories. Uh, we have a ROM or firmware which is on the board and it's responsible for starting the board when you power it on. Uh, but itself is not capable of doing anything special, so it needs a bootloader. Bootloaders usually are split into two stages. First stage, second stage, because of hardware limitations. First stage is extremely small. It's loaded directly from the ROM firmware. You can call it SPL or SBL, it depends on the implementation, doesn't really matter. And it's responsible for preparing the stage for the second stage bootloader, which is the real bootloader capable of loading kernels and then operating system. From there, the standard boot process of the operating system starts. You have the kernel. Uh, the kernel itself will need a device tree in order to communicate with the devices you have on, uh, on, the, uh, so on the hardware, with the hardware you have on the device. So for instance, the storage. And at one point in time, the kernel will load the, uh, will mount the rootFS and then start the user space. So this is a standard boot process. The goal of secure boot, or generally speaking, the goal of securing the boot process, there are different ways we can achieve it, is making sure that every single step is happening as we planned. We will see that there are different ways to do that. Uh, the most common way is using what is called verified boot. This is a category. Verified boot means asserting that the software that we are using during the boot process from the firmware to the kernel is uh, trusted. And the way we assert that the software is trusted is using uh, asymmetric encryption and digital signatures. So verified boot keeps track of the checksum and the signatures on the software that you are using during the boot process and verifies the signatures using a public key. It has several advantages. Uh, it gives total control over the boot process uh, to a signing authority. So the signing authority is capable of signing additional software packages. So when you want to upgrade the kernel or you want to upgrade the bootloader, you can sign it with a, a private key from the certification authority and it will be recognized by, by the device and it will be used to, to boot. It requires no external validation. So the device itself, together with the public key, we will see where it's stored, it's capable of checking the signatures on the uh, boot components and it will just boot without an external actor. And uh, as it's based on the cryptography, uh, it's very hard to, to defeat it, to break it. The whole world is based on uh, asymmetric encryption and symmetric cryptography. There are a few disadvantages, though, uh, because the signing authority has full control on the 
signatures on the boot components. It means that if the signing authority is compromised for whatever reason, then it can sign any malicious code and it will run on your device. All the device is doing is just checking the signatures. So losing control of the CA, of the signing authority, means potentially being able to run anything on the device. Uh, the cryptographic validation is done in the software. So in theory, it's possible to defeat it, just like any piece of software, though the probability are pretty low. And uh, there is no um, partial validation so the device either will boot because all the signatures are correct across the boot uh, components or it will stop and hang because the components are not signed correctly. There is no evidence that the boot process is correct once the device is up and running. So if you look at it from the user space perspective, when you have software running on your devices, if it's up and running, it means that the signatures are okay but you have no way in the user space to actually check what happened. You only know that the device is up and running. So the validation happens early on during the boot process and there is no uh, way to check the evidence of a correct boot once the device is up and running. And um, as I mentioned before, losing control of the signing authority can be problematic and uh, rotating signing keys with a verified boot, it's complicated because the key is on the device and rotating it, especially for embedded and connected devices where everything is in the field, uh, can create an escrow problem. So, how does secure boot relate to verified boot? As I mentioned before, verified boot is a category. Any uh, process to secure the boot of a device using asymmetric um, signatures, it's called verified boot. Secure boot is a type of verified boot and it's designed to protect systems uh, against malicious code that can be injected into the device of the boot process. Uh, this verification starts from the early on, the boot stage, so ROM firmware, and it ends at the kernel. It does not protect uh, the user space. So any software that you're running on the device, it's not protected by Secure Boot directly. Though we will see later in the presentation that it's possible to establish a chain of trust from the Secure Boot to the user space and somehow verify that what we are running on the device is still uh, uh, current. Uh, what are the key components of Secure Boot? As I mentioned before, it provides authentication and integrity. It can check that only authorized images can run on the device uh, because they are signed digitally and because of the checksums, they are not tampered. So you cannot alter any boot component of the device. It works using asymmetric encryption uh, and cryptography. So private key, public key, you know uh, the theory. Private key is used to sign and the public key is on the device and can be used to verify the code before running it. Uh, if it's available on the device, uh, it can take advantage of hardware security. So usually TPM, using the TPM2 protocol, you can store the uh, cryptographic materials on the device and the leverage hardware security. It, how it, does it work in practice? So nowadays, uh, sp specifically on x86 hardware, we use UFI uh, and the secure boot is a UFI mechanism. It protects against running the malicious code using a signature which is uh, present on the device and verifying the checksums and the signatures on it. Uh, in practice, Secure Boot was introduced by Microsoft uh, back in 2007, 2008. Uh, it was part of Windows 8, I think. Introduced with Windows 8 and became mainstream with Windows 10. So virtually any x86 hardware today gets delivered and provisioned with Microsoft keys. So it embeds the public key of Microsoft and it accepts any software signed by Microsoft. So you could ask me, how does it work with Linux then? Is Microsoft signing every single Linux kernel, every distribution? No, doesn't work like that. Uh, we have the Shim, boot Shim. Shim is a special software package which was created by a um, community of uh, developers from different distributions in order to create a minimal um, boot loader, first stage boot loader, which is shared across all the different distributions in the Linux uh, ecosystem. Microsoft signed the shim, and that's the only thing that Microsoft is signing. Thanks to the shim, 
the bootloader is capable of loading distribution-specific kernels or additional bootloaders. This is possible because the shim contains the signing keys from the main distributions, so Debian, Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, or whatever. Uh, so the shim is uh, the interface between the Microsoft keys and the keys from uh, uh, the different distributions. So thanks to the shim, it's possible to run on uh, secure boot enabled hardware any mainstream Linux distribution. Uh, what if you want to assign your boot components or what if, if you want to build your own kernel? In this case, it's not going to be signed by the distribution. It's your kernel, you're building it. Uh, the shim provides utilities to control your system. Of course, in theory, you could disable secure boot, just get rid of it and uh, boot without it, but it's not what you want to do. You want to control uh, your system. So uh, the shim provides um, utility, which is called MOK, so machine owner key, uh, which gives you the possibility to enroll additional keys into the system. We won't get into the technicalities, but using the MOK util software package, you can add additional public key to your shim and to the system, to the firmware, to make it possible to run software which is signed by your own private key. So this is what usually what you want to do if you control the hardware, uh, you're using, using a mainstream Linux distribution, you have the shim and you want to uh, build your own components. Using the machine owner keys, you have full control of, um, of the signature on the components, on the boot process components, and you can build your own. As I mentioned before, secure boot is not the only way you can secure the boot process. Uh, it's a type of verified boot. Just for the sake of completeness, uh, there is another way you can secure the boot and it's called measure boot. I don't know if you ever heard about it or you ever used it. Uh, measure boot, it's an alternative to a verified boot. It does not involve um, asymmetric uh, signatures using public and private key, but it measure the boot writing, usually writing in the hardware, uh, in special registries, the final state of computation of the boot components. So how it works, it's pretty simple. It's often called measured lunch. Uh, you can boot your device in a special mode that will record all the uh, different boot steps and store these measurements. So basically the checksums, final checksums in, um, in hardware. That's how it's implemented, using some specific registries, they are called PCRs, and ensuring that the next boot, the final result of the execution of the boot components will lead to the same checksums. If anything differs, then the boot process will be stopped. It's different from the um, a verified boot because there you have an external authority, certification authority, signing uh, the boot components. Here with measure boot, uh, you measure, you uh, verify the execution steps of the code and that's what you store into the hardware. You have more control on the boot process because at any point in time you can uh, instruct the device to store the new measurements. Uh, so in case of an upgrade, for instance, there is a special modality to write the PCRs if it's possible, depending on the device, uh, but there is no uh, external authority signing the, the components. It has several disadvantages. So first of all, it's not standard. It depends on the bootloader implementation, the hardware, so it's uh, not as common as a secure boot. And uh, uh, this local uh, attestation that the boot process was correct is something which happens physically on the device. So it usually happens at manufacturing time. You do the first boot, you store the results of these registries in the hardware, and then you seal them. So it's not possible to change them. Uh, of course, access to the device early on will make it possible to replace the software and store different uh, checksums. But uh, because of the lack of open and uh, standard solutions, uh, measure boot is not really mainstream in the embedded world. And usually we rely on verified boot and if it's possible on x86 hardware, mainly on secure boot. So let's look at edge IoT secure boot use cases, so specifically for the embedded world. As I mentioned before, UFI is uh, the de facto standard today. It replaced uh, BIOS in 2007. Uh, secure boot was introduced by Microsoft for x86 devices, so it's mainstream. Uh, it's included by default in Windows 10. It was included in preview in Windows 8. And uh, it works very well for x86. 
it's slightly different for non x86 hardware uh, because it depends on the implementation uh, on the board specific board so what i used to say is that generally speaking x86 like secure boot is not supported on arm devices um, it's not working as x86 it's not streamlined as x86 there are alternatives. Uh, the most famous one is uh, System Ready uh, from ARM, which is a certification program to standardize uh, verified boot across different vendors. It's already there, so there are several boards that support System Ready. It's not secure boot, it's not the same thing, but it's a similar technology. Still a verified boot with uh, cryptographic materials. However, because of the pe peculiarities of embedded devices, uh, verified boot on embedded devices usually involve writing the public key into the hardware, into the SOC. There are different ways you can achieve that using electrical fuse or, or OTP registries, uh, but storing the key at manufacturing time is uh, extremely important in the embedded world. Why? It's kind of obvious because the edge and IoT devices uh, have a different physical location than uh, desktop com computers, which are with us in a bag or in the office. You often don't have full control on the location of the device and attackers can have physical access to the device. It means that it's possible, for instance, to uh, access the device, remove the storage, replace components, and then plug in the storage again into the device. You can physically attack the device. For this reason, Secure boot in the embedded world uh, has different requirements than the ones that we have on desktop devices or uh, traditional x86 um, uh, hardware. Let's look at the limitations and gaps of uh, secure boot. As I mentioned before, secure boot is not going to solve all your security problems in the embedded world or your embedded devices. Uh, for instance, once the device is fully up and running, so you have your user space working, your application is working, the kernel is fully loaded, you don't have any runtime security provided by Secure Boot. So Secure Boot is done. The device is up and running and whatever is happening on the device is not Secure Boot responsibility. It means that the device can be hacked, malware can insert into the device and uh, nothing will be stopped by Secure Boot itself. Any change in the runtime of the device is not checked by Secure Boot. Uh, if the changes are not permanent on the storage, so you're not replacing boot components, changing the kernel, changing any device tree driver, uh, the device will just reboot fine next time. And if it was vulnerable because of default username and passwords or vulnerable software you're running on the device, an attacker can still uh, attack the device and uh, install malware on the device uh, next time it boots. So. Runtime security and secure boot are two orthogonal concepts. They are not related to each other. Uh, secure boot only verifies critical components in the boot process. As I mentioned before, we go down till the kernel, but once the kernel is up and running, uh, we don't do any check on the user space. So nothing will check what is running on the device. However, secure boot can work together with other technologies that can ensure that the user space is also coherent. So one of the most uh, common combinations is using secure boot with DM Verity, checking the root file system, and uh, this will create the so-called chain of trust. So the boot process will be trusted from the ROM firmware till the kernel. The kernel will load DM Verity, and with that it will check that the root FS is also coherent with what we expect. It's not direct responsibility of secure boot, but it's part of our overall strategy to secure end-to-end -end your device from the boot process to the user space. Um, important to highlight that secure boot only protects the integrity of the software. So there is no encryption involved in any of the boot components. So if one of the concerns on your device is protecting the IP on the device or the data which is present on the device, a secret boot doesn't help. It's always possible to remove the storage from the device, plug it somewhere else, and read the file system and read what is it, what is inside. Secure boot does not encrypt anything. It's only doing a verification during the boot process that the components are signed and can be trusted. 
another problem which uh, is linked to secure boot is that if something goes wrong, then the device won't boot. In case of an attacker replacing a boot component, the device will be bricked. There is no way you can boot the device because secure boot will just pause, stop the boot process and won't uh, continue. On ARM devices, we have additional constraints or limitations. As I mentioned before, uh, on ARM, we are not just there yet in terms of uh, standardization of the verified boot. Uh, hopefully, system ready uh, will be the standard, uh, but it still takes time. On x86, it's uh, very common to use secure boot because it's standard and it's uh, widespread. It's already 15 years that we are using secure boot on ARM. We still, we still need time. Uh, as I mentioned before, ARM is special and usually involves uh, specific hardware um, configurations to make it work. And because of the physical location of the devices, you want to write the public key on the hardware. And this involves, in uh, many cases, changes in the manufacturing line of your device in order to store the public key early on. Um, we can jump into the conclusions, so we can wrap up and summarize what we discussed so far. In this table, I try to summarize different attack vectors and how secure boot relates to them if it's uh, uh, usable to protect the device from that attack vendor. So first line, obvious, infection or replacement of critical components of the boot process, bootloaders, kernel, libraries, uh, is uh, covered by secure boot. So secure boot will make it impossible for an attacker without access to your private key, signing private key, to replace any component in the boot process without limiting you to update those components in the future because you can always rebuild a new version and then sign it and then update it uh, over the air. For runtime infection, secure boot partially covers the use case because as I mentioned before, it's not directly managed by secure boot. Uh, the user space verification, but as it can be done in the kernel using the mVerity, for instance, or if you think about um, other solutions which are available in the kernel, being part of the kernel which is loaded in the secure boot process, this creates a chain of trust. If I trust the bootloader which is loading the kernel and I'm trusting the kernel which is loading the kernel module which will be responsible for doing user space uh, integrity checks, then I'm, I have a chain of trust uh, that what is running on the device is actually what I want to run. For physical disassembly or replacement of components or extraction of secrets from the storage, secure boot doesn't help at all. It has no encryption mechanism. It's not going to protect the storage, any physical access to the device. Uh, removing the storage, plugging it somewhere else, will lead the attacker to the data which is on, on the device. You need other ways to encrypt the data if you need it. So using LUKS or DMCrypt or any other technology. In this case, secure boot is not the solution for your problem. And any runtime infection, as I mentioned before, so any vulnerability you have on your device, an attacker from the network which access the device, replace components, uh, change, uh, change the user space software you're running, this is also not protected by secure boot. Secure boot is only responsible for booting the device. And from there, what is happening is not a secure boot responsibility. And at this point, I think I'm done with the presentation and I open the floor for questions. Um, risk five devices. I personally don't have experience with risk five devices, so I don't know how it works. Uh, it's very hard for me to answer this question. My guess is that it depends on the again on the hardware implementation. Yeah. So the problem is uh, the lack of standardization. So generally speaking, x86 covered. Everything else, it depends. It depends on the hardware. So strict collaboration with the hardware vendor is what is required in order to implement secret boot. Okay, so how are, how are the secure boot uh, protecting the system libraries if they are like uh, on the root file system or something? 
yet yeah, actually it's not system libraries. I would say it's, it's probably a typo in the in the slides. More modules, kernel modules. So anything which is, can be loaded from from the kernel. So kernel modules is protected. So it's probably a typo in the slide. It's not system libraries, but modules which you can then use to do further verification. So DM Verity or um, DM Crypt are included in the secret boot because they are part of the kernel loaded as modules. So that's what I what I meant. So no, it's not secret boot is not going to protect anything which is in the user space, including shared libraries. These are not covered by secret boot. Yes. Yes, sure. So, um, Seeger Boot is not going to stop you uh, from updating your devices. It's possible to replace boot components as long as they are signed correctly. Generally speaking, OTA is agnostic, so you are not going to touch anything which is Seeger Boot related, even if you replace um, first stage or second stage bootloaders, as long as they are signed. All the verification starts from the ROM firmware of the device. That's why it's strictly connected with the hardware support. And it's always possible to replace uh, the boot components using uh, OTA strategy. Over the air, offline updates, doesn't really matter. One thing which is worth mentioning, though, is that if you're reusing, um, if you're using a binary distribution, so Debian, Ubuntu, it comes by default with the signing keys of the distribution, so shim and uh, uh, the public keys from the distribution. It's possible to enroll your own keys, uh, but our experience is that uh, you cannot easily get rid of the keys from the distribution. So at any point in time, an attacker, even if you streamline the kernel, you compile your own kernel and you sign it with your keys and then you um, add the public key using the mock utils, an external kernel from the distribution signed by Ubuntu or Debian will still be installed correctly because the shim embeds the public keys of the um, of the distribution. It's possible, technically speaking, to remove the distribution public keys, uh, but running updates, running apt get this upgrade on the device, we probably resume, reinstall uh, those public keys. So the way we go with Secret Boot and x86 on embedded devices is usually rebuilding our own boot components and uh, relying on our uh, public key at the hardware level and not using the shim. So that's what I see in the field for uh, specialized uh, devices, embedded devices. Uh, but if you're okay with running the shim and uh, trusting the kernels coming from the distribution, then you can just update the components, enroll, uh, eventually optionally enrolling your key using the mock util and build your own boot components. Everything which is happening in the user space is not relevant for, uh, for the secret boot, so you can just proceed with OTA as usual. Yes? Secure way? Short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's a big issue. It's a big yeah, issue. This is yeah. one of the disadvantages of using uh, verified boot in general. So yeah. if the signing key gets compromised, then it's a mess because you have devices okay. in the field and without physical access to the device, there is no way you can okay. replace in a secret manner. So you uh, would have to have keys. physical access and yeah, then directly yeah. deploy and the new keys. For embedded devices, usually the key is stored on the hard in the hardware yeah. in a permanent way. So there is no easy way to replace it. So okay. mm -hmm. you are in trouble. Okay. You don't want to. So keep your keys secure or UCA. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you probably want to replace the device. That's all you, all you can do. Yeah. To, to follow up with this question, I've seen that many devices have more than one key. So probably you can mitigate this one by having more than one CA or more, public, more private key and then uh, revoke them on field if one of them is uh, waste, I mean. This is correct, however, it creates an escrow problem. So how can you trust the key which is revoking the other? So when you have multiple keys, it's not that easy to, to say that it's an attacker using the secondary key to replace the, the previous one. So you are just having two possible keys that can be 
attacked or yeah 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 or, but you or, can you can separate the key in different stories i mean this this is the, the managing the private key is the, the 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 biggest problem of all of this and so you can rely to have different places and w where you build your your images to store these three four private keys so you uh, mm, mm, it, it, only one can be compromised if someone attack for example your uh, build system yeah you are right so managing the keys in this context having them in different physical locations with different uh, access permissions is, is is crucial anyway i agree this is uh, the biggest problem of all this secure boot stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the yeah. problem with any implementation of the verified boot. So not only secure boot, but system ready works in exactly the same way. So any uh, implementation of verified boot is affected by the problem of managing the keys. We have an online question. Um, what if it is possible to modify the boot select pins when opening the device so it would boot with a different SPL that just won't check anything? Can you then still talk about secure boot? So can you repeat the question, please? Um, what if it is possible to modify the boot select pins when opening the device so it would boot with a different SPL that just won't check anything? Can you then still talk about secure boot? Uh, technically speaking, it's secure boot implemented on the device. I wouldn't say the device is fully secured in this boot process. So if the hardware gives you the possibility with a pin to select a different SPL, so the first stage, and then from there you can boot whatever you want, maybe in maintenance mode, then of course you are not securing your device from a physical attack in the field. So again, this goes back to the idea that depending on the use case, depending on where the device is located, uh, who can access the device, what are the conditions for your specific project, you have to select the right hardware and the right conditions. So there are boards where it's possible to program um, the enroll the keys and then uh, burn fuses, so it won't be possible anymore to change the boot process from the hardware with pins. It really depends on the board. Uh, it's, that's why it's so special for embedded devices. With, with desktop computers, we don't have this problem, or at least we, it's, it's a partial issue. Uh, with embedded, uh, the key is the hardware and the support from the vendor uh, in order to implement a secure boot strategy. It's not only the technical implementation of secure boot, it's more about an end-to-end -end strategy to ensure the device is booting the right software. Hi. Uh, can you explain a bit more how DM Verity can protect the root file system? Uh, it's not going to protect it from um, securing the IP you have on the device, uh, but it can uh, verify the integrity of it. So DM Verity is going to check the checksums of the file system and ensuring that what you are mounting, so the file system, it's a read-only file system in this case, is the one that you want to load and is not tampered with. So any change to the rootfs will uh, lead to a failure in mounting it from the kernel, so the device won't boot. So in this case, you are trusting the kernel because of secure boot and all the chain of trust you created till the kernel, and then the kernel is responsible for mounting a file system uh, where the checksum, let's simplify, the checksum of the file system is known and it will refuse to mount anything else. So if you change uh, the file system, then the kernel should know it. And as you can only load the kernel that you trust because of secret boot, you have a chain of trust from the bootloader till the user space. It doesn't mean that what you have on the file system is verified, but you can verify that the file system you're mounting is the one that you want to mount. It is also requires some machinery during updates because when you want to change the rootfs performing an a b update so moving to a new version of your software uh, delivering an ota update uh, you want to make sure that the kernel will trust the new content of the rootfs but it's all about integrity in this case okay thanks hello uh, i would like to ask if uh, secure boot is used in mender because you mentioned Mender previously. Yes, Mender supports secure boot, but uh, as I mentioned before, there is nothing special that is required by an OTA agent to support secure boot. Mm -hmm. So the way I describe it is that Mender doesn't mess up with uh, secure boot.
that's all you need to do. Because it's way, it's earlier in the boot process, it's not going to affect anything which is happening in the user space. So apart from signing uh, the components that you're going to install and replace on the device, you don't have to worry about anything else. Secure boot uh, does not dictate anything special in the user space when the device is up and running. It's early on in the boot stage. But yes, it's supported. Mm. And my second question is, how constrained are, are these devices? I mean, the devices you have uh, checked with Secure Boot, how, how constrained are they, uh, they are in terms of memory? What uh, type of devices, of real devices, have you used? Secure Boot is extremely lightweight. It's only checking checksums and the final states. So it's not going to compute a, check, um, a signature check on, on the whole file system, two gigabytes. So it's implement, you can implement Secure Boot on virtually any device that can boot Linux. So memory constraints or CPU constraints are not a problem with the secret boot implementation. Okay, thank you. I think we are over with time, so thank you very much. And if you have any follow-up questions, just feel free to get in touch with me.